Welcome to the Healing Grove Podcast. I'm Dr. Kristen Ryman, an integrative holistic family physician, author of Life After Lyme, and host in this virtual space of learning, healing, and growing. I believe humans are like trees, and our physical limb is only one of many. Health on all limbs of the tree, emotional, conceptual, social, spiritual, is absolutely required for the whole tree that is you to be vibrantly well. I created the Healing Growth Podcast as a place to showcase some of the world's best integrative and holistic medicine, to expose you to transformative tools and mindset shifts for all limbs of your tree. I hope you enjoy our conversation in the Healing Grove today as much as I enjoyed having it. Here we are, and thanks everyone for tuning in. I am so delighted today to introduce you to my amazing friend, Hannes Fulyun. Hannes is a coach, a social entrepreneur, and an advocate for families of children with special needs. He has a passion for supporting people working through trauma by teaching them how to build sustainable support networks in order to help them finish strong. And he's going to tell us what that means, I think. <laughs> After working with his own children with special needs and accomplishing what was deemed impossible, he and his wife, Yana, also awesome, founded the nonprofit Brainchild Fund based in both South Africa and in the U.S. Through that work, they have coached over 225 families to connect with that wider circle of support. And now they're taking their message of hope to the larger world through online programs and one-on-one -on -one coaching. And Hannes, I'm so grateful that you agreed to be on this. Thank you for taking the time to do this. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you so much. It's a pr privilege and an honor to be here and to share with you and just to visit with you. And I guess all of the guests, you know, um, today it's just about talking about the things that we don't usually talk about and just explore different options and share what we have to learn from each other. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So why don't we start by hearing a little bit about your journey? I'm sure the audience would want to know all the details I get to know from being your friend, but tell us how you got into this work and why trauma really calls to you. Yes, thank you. Um, so yeah and everybody has a story to tell and so thank you for having me giving me an opportunity to do that um so my wife and i um have four beautiful children and three of them happen to have special needs so we we had four children in four years okay um and by design you know people mock us and tease us all about you know how that happened and uh, i just tell people it's focus you know we, <laughs> so long story short, we had the four children in four years and three of them happened to have special needs. So my eldest, Kana, she was born a healthy little young lady and um, she had suffered a pediatric stroke at 13 months of age. She lost two thirds of the left hand side of her brain and um, which left her a hemiplegic. She was literally blind in the right eye, deaf in the ear. Um, she had facial palsy. She lost all function in the right hand side of her body. And, you know, in an instance, we lost literally half of our child. So speaking of trauma and loss and grief and, and being in that moment, um, it, it really, it, it really shakes your world standing there watching your child deteriorating, not knowing if she's going to make this what to do, how to do it, um, and not even knowing what's going on, like literally just seeing her losing half of her. So that was, that was really, really hard for Jan and I to witness. Yeah. Um, and then in the same time, so Gian was born um, 14 months after Kana's birth. So um, Gian was born with Down syndrome. And we didn't know, um, they didn't pick it up through the testing and we didn't know about Gian's diagnosis. So he was uh, born with so low muscle tone that he didn't have all the reflexes. Um, he had a severe brain injury and his, his um, muscle tone was so low that he couldn't, um, he, the pupils in his eyes could not um, constrict and dilate and therefore vision was an issue for him. He didn't have a, a suckle reflex. So Jan had to express milk and feed it to him with a teaspoon. And he would, you know, we had to teach him how to swallow. 
where to teach him how to see, where to teach him how to hear. And we literally fought for his life for the first three, four months of his life. I say he, he had such low muscle tone, his skin literally held him together. You know, it, it was, it, that's, that's, that's Dia. Now, and, hold on, uh, let me interrupt you. I'm sorry, but I'm just putting the timeline together. And I didn't realize they were so close in age. And so kind of was just around the time she was experiencing her stroke when he was born, exactly. is that right? Exactly. Yeah. So, so for Jan and I, that, that four months is literally the craziest time in our lives where we, uh, we had two children in hospital um, and <laughs> we had no idea what's going on. Jana was trying to recover from giving birth to Gian. So she had um, some health issues. Um, she was at, at people who hosted us uh, trying to help Gian and I was at hospital with Kana. And obviously in that three, four time, year, three, four months of our lives, we didn't have any income. So we literally had a financial royal flush in that time. We, we literally lost everything that we had, uh, including the home we lived in, everything. We just, we just let it be. And, um, we moved in with people and in that time we just fought for for the lives of our children and my wife and and everybody so um it was it was really really a rough time for us um yeah <clears throat> and then just after that leo was born in that recovery you know getting home you know, we we rented a home um we we started recovering to you know getting a hold of our lives. Um, Leo was born and he was born with an umbilical cord around his neck, which meant that for a time being through the birth canal, he did not have oxygen and blood flow to certain parts of his brain, which caused an injury. And the symptoms of that was the similar to someone who's on the spectrum, you know, like the autistic spectrum. So Leo did not speak, started speaking uh, after about, four and a half, close to five years old. Um, he was literally this wallflower child, serious sensory issues, tactilely, auditorily, uh, visually. He, you know, I couldn't hug him. He didn't make eye contact. I couldn't wrestle him. I couldn't, I, I always say, you know, everything that happened to us, I think for me, it was the hardest dealing with Leo because, um, Loving someone so much, so intimately and deeply and giving everything you can and it's one-way traffic and there's just nothing coming back. No recognition, no eye contact, no, not, you know, it's just, it's just one-way traffic. It really, really was hard for me as a dad who is, who is an involved guy and, and, you know, wanting to wrestle and be with my kid. He was just gone and totally absent and totally withdrew purposefully um, to survive. <clears throat> and um, after getting the understanding of, of what he's going through and starting to work with the root cause of the problems, he started, um, his brain started healing, the symptoms started going away. And today, Leo is a, uh, Jim Carrey is his favorite character. And he's, he's that extrovert in our house where mm -hmm. every night he tells me, let's go wrestle, let's, you know, let's do stuff together. And he rough house with the whole family. Like we're, he, he's come a long, long way. But in that time, you know, it was, it was Kana, it was Gian's birth and Kana's stroke. Then um, we also lost Jana's father. I can't go too deep into that, but um, in South Africa, living there, stuff happens. And uh, he was in an armed robbery. And so we lost Jana's father in basically the same time. So <laughs> when it comes to a cumulative, uh, loss and shock and, and trauma in a whole, we had it in, in a year, um, losing everything we had. And, and so, <clears throat> and then after that, Abigail was born and she's our well child. She's a neurotypical child. And uh, she, she just became our cheerleader, our ray of light in the house, just uh, keeping us on our toes and, and showing us that there is hope and normality to whatever that means. But, um, you know, it just sticking us together as a family. And we, we had to then learn how to, um, how to deal with things, how to cope with things, how to, 
um, how to resist certain things, prognoses and, and almost like death sentences spoken out of our children, like and out of, over us as a family. You will never, this person will never be able to do this and this and this, which contradicts, you know, sometimes, well, for us, the science contradicted the truth that we had in our hearts over our children. And there came a point where, where the medical science is what it is. Like you see a brain scan and you see the medical science and it is what it is. But then also in our hearts, we knew what our children's identities are and who they are as people. And you know, this just didn't match. And so we had to make, a, make some big decisions and we, we chose to go for the truth instead of the medical facts. And out of engaging in this, um, we were able to, to um, overcome some of those prognoses. And today our children are in public schools. They are well established into normal society. You know, um, they've overcome what was deemed impossible. And together as a family, we have accomplished that. So, but we, it, you know, it didn't come easy. It, it wasn't the pill we drank. It wasn't something we ordered on Amazon. It's, it's something we, we had to wrestle with, we had to grapple with, we had to um, engage and choose life, even if it was um, deemed impossible, you know? And that's, that's a little bit about our story. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I'm, every time I hear you tell it, I, I hear more layers of it. And I, I know that you've shared more here than you've shared in the past with me. And I'm really grateful for that. It's such a powerful story and it really demonstrates how you come by this passion um, for helping others to heal from their trauma really naturally. And honestly, you know, you've yeah. had it in spades. And um, one of the things I love about you and why I really wanted to speak to this tribe here is that you have such a passion for sharing these tools with others. Um, tell us a little bit about um, your coaching and what you, what you accomplish with that. Sure. Um, so thank you. <clears throat> because we've been through this, we, we, we help from a position of serving and connecting with people instead of telling people what to do from, a, from just a scientific point of view. It's, it's become more of a, an opportunity and a blessing to serve people and share with them on, from the same level, you know, and just associating with people and with their pain and their hurts and their struggles. Um, and so, yeah, I think, um, out of, out of, um, our history and, and our losses, and we've learned things that we should have done or should not have done. And out of that, we created a program and some tools to, uh, to equip people that is going through that process at this point to orientate themselves. Where am I in this process? What's going on? And um, and to, to motivate them, uh, one, to know that they're not alone. You know, th there are so many things that we've put together um, and just put it in, in, a, in a sequence. So one, it's palatable while you're in, in the disarray, while you're in the storm. Um, it's not just information. It's just, it, it, it's just bits of information that makes you go, oh, okay, this is where I'm at. I'm not going, I'm not losing it. I'm not crazy. You know, this is what's out of my control. This is what's in my control. You know, stuff like that, just conversations um, and facilitating the process instead of resisting it all. Um, it just helps you to do that. And then understanding what your natural inclination is, is to isolate and just pull back all of us if, as humans. That's what we do. And that helps for a while, <clears throat> but sometimes we get stuck in that. And then that doesn't have an outcome that we all want, really. So we, we, we just share the, the road um, that we've taken and people add flavor to that. So that's basically what, what we have to offer. <clears throat> and I know in your program um, and what you've done with Brainchild Fund really helps people connect to these different pillars. And do you call them pillars or do you call them branches? Help us, help us with that concept and, and let, us, let us in on what those pillars are because I think it, it helps to kind of know what the terrain looks like if you're a person who's experiencing trauma or just living with trauma of the past because trauma in the past continues as trauma in the present until you heal from it. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> and so we, 
in as a whole, <clears throat> we help people. Um, so one of the concepts is um, seeing for everything, seeing everything for the way it is, for everything that it is, and everything that it's not. Like um, there's a saying, it, a moment of truth. Sometimes we're in denial or we're unsure or we're in disbelief, and that's part. Of, that's one of the stages. <clears throat> And we're understanding that and working through that and getting to a point where you understand, okay, I just honestly lost half of my child. That is what happened. Dealing with that and healing through that puts you in a position where you can move forward. Um, if you skip that phase, <clears throat> it's hard to move on. And so, so without getting into the detail, we, what the process, what the, course and what it is that we offer does is it helps people to understand trauma the science of trauma where am i in the traumatic process the natural healing process of that mm -hmm. and once they've worked through that using what was against them to work for them and to break the isolation go into the community and 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 share that and invite people to become part of your winning team because for most of us, the trauma and the stuff that we're dealing with is bigger than who we are and that we can handle by ourselves. And by sharing our vulnerability from a place of healing <clears throat> is very inviting for people because the community wants to help. They simply don't know how. But if we, if we work through the trauma, loss and grief and the guilt and the fear and shame that comes with that and present, uh, present ourselves from a place of healing and restoration and a positive future, people are naturally inclined to want to join your team to help you win. <clears throat> and so it just changes the whole perspective of do, from doom and gloom to something happened that was out of my control. I'm aware of that. I'm working through that. And you know what? I want to invite you to be part of my team as we overcome this together. Um, that just puts everything in a whole different bracket and it makes it palatable it makes it um something that that seems doable and this, the moment people start engaging in that it takes the load off of one person trying to overcome something by themselves all the time which which makes us all feel like we just simply can't do that so what i'm hearing you say is that, that you help people shift their sort of self-concept from one of this happened to me it's all terrible i'm a victim to this happened to me and I'm ready to recover and I can't do it alone. So I can, I can make that invitation to a larger team from that, that place rather than the, for me, more of like, yeah, exactly. everyone has trauma. Now I'm ready to bust a move. Who wants in? Exactly. <clears throat> exactly. And, and the key is that you can't move forward positively if you haven't grappled with the truth of what happened. And that's, you know, and understanding what that looks like um, helps people to engage. And if you've gone through the natural progression, you come out better on the other side. If you skip some of the stages or you suppress it, that's where uh, depression or anger bursts out and stuff like that comes and you need to numb that. And you know, th there's a lot of symptoms that comes from, this is once again, dealing with the root cause of stuff. Um, that empowers you to heal and recover and, and restore as a family, not just as a person. Because, and that's one of the other things. When we go through trauma, we think it's us. You know, when, when some of us are diagnosed with a cancer or with, or you find out your child is dealing with a drug issue or whatever, whether it's you or a child or a family member, it doesn't just affect that person. It affects the family and it affects the community <clears throat> that's why there are reactions and we knowing that we have the power and the tools to engage with those people with the extended family and with the community to help get through that it's it's just a powerful way of dealing with things instead of trying to do it on our own all the time um, and so that what I'm you say is there's power in asking for help and connecting to that larger source and that larger network Exactly. And then, but also how we ask for help is not a thing of the doom and gloom and begging for help because we all hate that to do it. And secondly, we hate it if people ask us from that position. 
but inviting people to be part of the journey while being vulnerable, but also being at a point of I'm engaged in healing, people follow purpose. <clears throat> so the moment that there is a, there's a plan, there's a strategic plan to an end, people want to get involved. And, uh, you know, I'll get, in, I'll get into just a little, you know, one of the points that we handle is, is what that strategy looked like, how we empower the community to help us. That's, I think that's point number five that we're, uh, that we're going to touch base on. <clears throat> Are we ready? Are we ready for point number five? <laughs> I don't know. Where, where are we? So, you know, the five things that, that I wanted to share is, first of all, um, people, people have to know that they're not alone. They don't, they don't have to go through things by themselves. Uh, the community cares and that they have a story and people want to listen to their story. Whenever I work with people <clears throat> and I, I usually ask, you know, for feedback, the number one thing that people share afterwards is, Thank you for listening. Thank you for sitting down, zipping, and just listening to my story. Because part of that is helping them grapple and understand and putting into sequence what happened. And it's so important that we, that we do that. So uh, working through that, um, <clears throat> and as you share, you kind of, it falls into place. And the second thing is understanding the science of trauma. Uh, you know, where am I in that process? What does it look like? And um, so many people tell me, I thought I was losing my mind. I thought it, it, it became a neurological or a character flaw or I'm losing my marbles. I'm, I'm, but actually, it's just part of the natural healing process. So understanding where you are in the healing process and embracing that also helps you to have confidence to be where you at, because you can't pretend that you're not where you at, because it is what it is. And you know there's a next thing. Like you're exactly. not necessarily stuck there just because you're feeling stuck. Exactly. Many people get stuck at why me? Why did this happen? What mm -hmm. did, you know? And if you understand that that's part of the process, you embrace it instead of just resisting and being stuck there. So understanding the science and the natural um, flow of healing for every person and working with that just streamlines the process and it empowers people to, to shorten the time span. Because uh, you don't want to skip steps, but you, it doesn't have to take years. We, we're tapping into our power as human beings. We can really recover from traumatic things really quickly if we, if we understand it and just streamline that process. So it's, it's, we're very adaptable. Um, and that, gives, that empowers people to understand that. And then... We spoke a little bit about breaking the isolation. Once you've worked through the trauma, knowing that you can present yourself correctly, you can, you can invite the community to be part of your winning team um, because they want to be, you know, make it, make, make them feel wanted, make them feel, people want to help. They simply don't know how, so we strategize and we make them a part of that. And then, um, learning that the community really cares about you and your family, putting that strategy together, and then how to build that support structure it stands on four pillars. That's, these are the number five, and that's the four pillars. The one is teaching people how to build a, sustain, um, a, a spiritual team around them. Um, I, it doesn't matter what religion you're in, but things are handled in spirit first. It's so important to have a holistic approach about this, so finding spiritual peace is crucial. <clears throat> and sometimes it's hard for us to just get that by ourselves. So to connect with someone who is spiritually secure, that we can check in with them on a weekly basis, we highly recommend that. And then, uh, you know, just be with someone in that space for once a week to find that peace and then move from that core strength uh, to the next so the spiritual team then an emotional team <clears throat> having set up a, a, a um, uh, for the for the ladies usually I say set up a coffee date with someone uh, who's going to see you once a week um, same day same time same place every week that's that's something that you just you can look forward to that and it's someplace 
where someone is just going to sit and listen and you can share and you can vent and you can breathe and let go of the stuff for the men. Usually they want to hit a couple of golf balls. They want to get rid of some aggression because we all um, handle things differently. And so instead of taking that out on each other uh, in a marriage or in, on our children or where it needs to come out somewhere. So why don't we just prov- be truthful to that? and then provide an opportunity for that to vent somewhere where it's safe and and wise. So that's the emotional team. Then the physical team. Uh, Many times, um, many of our people have um, mobility issues or they are alone or um, they they need physical help. Someone who will take care of the children, the other children while I'm I'm in hospital helping this child or just taking the children to school while, while I'm taking care of something necessary, you know, um, a crisis that I need to do. Just someone on a, on a physical team. Sometimes it's literally just someone who will watch the children while mom and I just go on a date night. Um, that's all, you know, healing, working with, for, with a relationship. So you need just someone physical, practical, who's lives next door, has keys to your house, you trust and you can give them a missed call and they've been pre-briefed and they know what's going on and it's pre-arranged. They just come and take over and you can run and take care of whatever you need to do. So it's very important that we have that in place. And then um, a financial team. <clears throat> Usually when, when something like this happens, you get a royal flush financially. Um, most of our, the people that we work with, um, with special needs um, parents, mom usually loses her income and then because she has to be home with that child Mm -hmm. and then suddenly the medical um sorry sorry and suddenly the medical bills just jump through the roof and uh, and so people need financial help many people need financial help and we don't want to ask for that so we want to build a team around us um that's going to help us succeed our goals and we don't ask people for money we never 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 ask people for money but what we do is we provide an opportunity for people to help us get to where we need to be people have time and talent and treasure and positioning and with whatever they have they would love to engage to help you succeed and reach your goal and it's incredible the stories that we have heard of people reaching out to the community. This is, this is the part that really excites me, Kristen, is, and that's why I pursue this work, is when people go through this process and are vulnerable, vulnerable and share their vulnerability in the community, one, how the community responds to that, and then how the community is healed and restored and integrated back into humanity because of something that happened that was out of our control. And the beautiful things that comes out of this, I can tell you stories upon stories of how people contact me and said, um, you know, how they were restored by seeing how another family fights for the life of a child or, um, you know, something that was deemed impossible. And they actually had given up on their families without having that hardship. And they go, oh, my goodness, I just I'm, I was exposed to a new level of commitment and stuff like that so it's just a beautiful story of restoring communities and and we're passionate about that wow i'm i almost am crying it's you know i i have in my mind the image of the work you do every year with the with the bike race will you share that because i feel like a lot of like that represents so much of what you're talking about in terms of involving the community and allowing people an outlet for their passion and their purpose, a place to put their money or their time or their, their treasure and their talent so that others can succeed. And as a, as a result, everybody wins. Oh, absolutely. Yes. I'd love to share that. So one of my passions is just to go ride bicycle. And what happens is it helps me to, to, to overcome things that was deemed impossible. Sometimes our giants or our challenge is so big and it's so long that we lose track and we feel like we can't do that. But for me, going up a mountain with my bike helps me to, every time I win and don't give up. It, it Success breeds success. It helps me to engage with my life and my family and, and to overcome things. And so that was personally an, 
And then we started meeting other people who like doing the same things, who don't even have special needs families, but who wants to ride for a cause. And so we entered into um, some races. We're doing two in the US and two in South Africa. Um, <clears throat> and, and what we do with the one in South Africa is we, we have a little a chariot that we put special needs children in. And I'm gonna tell you about this one instance where we had a special needs child in the chariot and we had mom, and then we, it's, it's 60 miles. So it's all day long. We ride from one point to another through Johannesburg. And uh, we're part of, I think about 29,000 people who ride this journey together. But <clears throat> we do this to show that we never leave the injured behind. And secondly, we do it um, to show that the community care, because the people who are um, hauling and cycling with us, they don't have special needs kids, but they are people who care about those families. And so we, we started merging two worlds together. And so this one mom, she would um, um, appreciate me sharing her story, but um, her child was, was born and um, it was said that their child will never see um, a year old. He, he would never live to one year old. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it was really hard for them as a family, but they worked through it. And he was four years old at that stage and he was nominated to be in the chariot. And um, mom was going to ride with us <clears throat> the, the, the whole race. And I think we were about four. Mom is fit, so she's a runner. And she thought she was just going to get on a bicycle and, and complete the race. And at mile four of, of, of 60, mom burned out her legs and she was like, I can't do this, I'm done. And I said to Will, you can't quit because your child's gonna be the one finishing, going through the finish line for the grand finale. You, you just, it's not gonna happen, you can't quit on us. And she said, well, I, I simply don't have what it takes. And so what happened is naturally everybody who was there started coming in behind her, literally taking her by the backpack and the shoulder and started pushing her <clears throat> to the finish line, okay? And then two kilometers before the end, little he, her child starts crying and he's just literally at the end, it's so hot. We pull him out of the chariot and uh, we're, there's no shade, it's so hot. We're all standing around them and baby's crying and you know, he's special needs, so he's vulnerable. We don't want to expose him. So we're thinking evacuate, whatever. We, we, you know, we can't finish with a crying child and a mom who's just so tired. And at a point, mom just looked at me and, and, and said, let's finish this. So what we did was we cut the roof of the chariot open. We put mom, and her child in the chariot, somebody else grabbed her bicycle and we helped them together as the community, we crossed the finish line together. And she was weeping saying, Hannes, I was never supposed to cross that finish line. I didn't deserve it. And my child didn't deserve to live. But because the community stood together, we can do this, we've done this. And it's become a, um, such a token of what it is that we can do together as community, as people who care. And um, it's just so powerful. It's just stuff that uh, makes me get up in the morning, makes me see my life and my things in perspective, my giants and my challenges. And so we've become friends. We are, we're a community, a sense of community that fights and overcome things together. Hmm. That's an incredible story. So, so powerful. Thank you for sharing it. You're and welcome. thank you for doing what you're doing in the world. It's so needed and it's, it's having such a huge impact. So before we finish, Hannes, I just want to, is there anything that, that we haven't touched on yet that you would want people who are sitting with their own trauma, either because they have a child with special needs or because their own lives have taken them into a place, their health is in the, in the ditch, they're not sure what to do, and they're experiencing trauma. What, any last words for this, for this group of people who might be listening? Yes. Giving up is not an option, okay? Um, 
your life is worth fighting for. Your family is worth fighting for. Um, you are worth fighting for. And by reaching out and saying, I, being a, it's okay to not have what it takes at this moment to overcome. It's okay. But being okay with that is a choice. Um, and that's, that's the first part. And then reaching out to people who are willing and able to, to facilitate that process and, and um, getting you to the next phase and the next step is crucial because life is, is not about reaching that end goal and arriving and getting the cup. It's about, it's about the next step, the journey and being in the moment of hardship. It's, we resist this stuff, but it's part of life. Hardship is, is part of life and so is overcoming and so is victory. Um, and they come in seasons, but if we see it as a whole and we embrace life as a whole in ourselves and the value that we bring, it makes all the difference. So that's, you know, reach out, don't give up. It's not an option. Reach out to people who love and care for you um, because your, your life is worth fighting for. Mm. Amen to that. Thank you, Hannes. If people wanted to reach out to you, for example, to learn about your coaching or learn about your program or just talk, um, I know that you have a WhatsApp number. Can we share that here? Yes, absolutely. Um, so my number is 267-304-2642. If anybody shoots me a WhatsApp, um, what I usually do is I have a 15-minute free just an orientation call to understand what the need is to see if that's a good fit, if I can help. Um, and then we have that conversation. And if that works, we can go into the next phase of maybe engaging in, in our six week program or doing a, a, a call where we work through some of the stuff. And, and so we'd love to help. Yeah. We'd love to get in touch with people. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Hannes. You're very welcome. And thank you for doing what you're doing. It's a privilege to love and share and to be the best we can be on your platform as well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Healing Grove podcast. If you liked it, please be sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to deepen your experience further, consider grabbing a copy of the Healing Grove playbook. With journal prompts for this podcast and 41 others, it's the perfect place to record your learnings, keep track of the tools you explore, and reflect on your own experience. Finally, it's important to mention that even though I am a doctor, nothing you hear on this podcast, whether from myself or my guests, constitutes medical advice. Any intervention you try should always be discussed with and supervised by a trusted member of your own healing team. Thanks for listening, and see you next time in the Healing Grove.